Everybody, welcome to The Sherman Show. I am Jeff Sherman, along with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today is Tuesday, March 28th, 2023. And we are recording from the Double Line offices here in downtown Los Angeles. So Sam and I split rooms today. He got the comfy chair. I lost, obviously, the Rochambeau. And I'm sitting in the awkward chair in the conference room. So congrats, Sam. Another well-played victory with you on the Rochambeau. I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. So you've got the colors. Yeah, I do have the colors, you know, and, um, you know, it's much more vibrant. Uh, but if you didn't notice, we do have a guest with us today. And that was none other than Jen Wing. Jen is a SVP or a senior vice president, also the head of asset management at GeoWealth. She's responsible for delivering on the broad range of investment needs for GeoWealth clients, ensuring that the platform offers access, flexibility, and investment expertise. If you haven't noticed by now, I am reading the description of Jen's title. So welcome to the show, Jen. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, so Jen, we've known each other for a period of time. Maybe you could walk our listeners through kind of your background um, how you entered into the investment business and the finance industry as a whole, uh, what set you on that career path, and how you ended up at your latest stint at GeoWell. Yeah, um, no one loves talking about themselves uh, more than that's the reason for going on a podcast, right? So right. I started at um, at JP Morgan. I spent my entire career at JP Morgan before I came to GeoWell, and I'm the um, I started in 2008. And I would say I was always motivated by money and I always wanted to be kind of an entrepreneur. So I, I wanted to get to the city. I grew up with no money, which is probably why I was motivated by no money, by having money. And I got to JP Morgan and I didn't know how lucky I was until I got there. I kind of felt like JP Morgan, big bank, is this really for me? And I landed at JP Morgan and JP Morgan is, if you're young in your career and you don't know what you want to do, it's a breeding ground for learning and developing and figuring out what the markets are doing. We had an 8 a.m. meeting every single morning where we talked about how to help clients, what was going on. It was obviously the global financial crisis. So on top of being in this breeding ground for learning, we, we had the global financial crisis happening around us. And I remember having no idea what was going on, but we would have late night pizza parties where we would talk about how can we help clients from making bad decisions in these markets and they were holding too much cash. And it was there that I met um, my first mentor at JP Morgan. Her name was Jamie Kramer. Um, wicked smart, super commercial and a human, right? You talk to her and it's like no filter. And I was like, I love this woman. And she actually asked me in the middle of a meeting, I was leading a meeting, I was on a product team before product was full. And I, she asked me in the middle of a meeting, do you want to come work for me? I'm running the due diligence team. I want to start this new platform. You're obviously a hard worker, come work for me. And I looked at my boss next to me and I was like, another woman who I loved. She's like, go for it. So I went and it's because I was following the money and I was following leaders that I could find that could really navigate you through a place like JP Morgan. You, you need that. And I grew up to two hippie parents. I had no idea what this industry was. I had no guidance, right? So I kind of followed um, Jamie and I got very lucky there because I was not only in a, a business that was this breeding ground for, for learning, but I ended up on an uh, due diligence team in the private bank where we were doing detective research on, on different asset managers. That's where we met Jeffrey. And we were looking at creating a platform where we could pair managers together and create these multi-asset portfolios that clients could go into if they wanted to express a view, but maybe they weren't ready to put all their cash to work. And what I learned in that role is that you know, due diligence is, it's not a check the box exercise, right? It's a, it's a real human connection. It's about learning the story of a firm. It's about learning who the people are behind it and doing all the quantitative analysis next to it. So we would pair managers together. We grew that platform from zero to, I think, $20 billion by the time I left. I moved over to London. 
Um, I failed several times in London trying to commercialize a business for a very disparate audience. Um, I think my first presentation got thrown in the middle of a, a, a room because I used the wrong currency. So I failed. I actually met my second mentor there, a man named uh, Christoph Gleick. He's the head of um, Harbor Capital Management now. And he um, and he taught me how to get back up again, right? And so I kind of learned how to interview, how to learn, how to get the most out of experts. And then I learned how to fail, but then fail gracefully and get back up again. And moved back uh, to the US, went to business school, went to Wharton. And I kind of felt like I was in a candle factory and the rest of the world was inventing electricity, right? We were. We were moving, we were moving into the ETF space, but it was this big ship that we were moving, right? And so I moved over, there was a brand new business that was starting, it was gonna launch a robo-advisor platform. And I took a product role, kind of doing, on the investment team, doing investments, building out portfolios, and then creating content. And that's where I learned the importance of communication and content when it came to investments. So communicating stories, no matter how rich, or how you know poor your audience was, nobody had a lot of time. So creating those stories um, make, without dumbing them down, simplifying them. And so we helped launch our, our robo-advisor at JP Morgan. Um, and there I worked for a guy named Ted Dimmig. He eventually introduced me. They, they took that business down because they realized these were tools that should be used across the entire business, not their own line of business. So, um, Ted, I talked to Ted and I was like, I think it's time. I really liked the RIA space because the RIA space was growing. And this is how I moved from JP Morgan to GOL. And I talked to Ted. I was like, I want a space that's growing. I want a space that's still doing the digital. Um, and I became fascinated by the RIA space. And he introduced me um, to a guy named Colin Falls. I didn't know what a TAMP was. So probably nobody knows on this audience. Maybe they do what a TAMP is. So well, Jen, you, you, you must have got a hold of uh, Sam's question because we wanted to ask you what a TAMP is, but we're going to let you define it. Yeah. Um, so a TAMP is a turnkey asset management platform, right? So if you think about, and, and GOL specifically, is a very different TAM. So I'm going to talk about TAMs and then I'll talk about I'll talk about GOLF. But if you think about TAMs, most of them, if you've heard of Investnet or Orion or Asset Mark, they've all kind of they've all mostly started as asset managers. And then they realized that they could build out more of a comprehensive solution for advisors and platforms that you were using their asset management. They'd have a model marketplace. And then they would have technology solutions to be able to do trading, to do back office operations, like the full kind of comprehensive approach, all coming from the asset management space. So pretty big, tend to buy technology, sometimes build it, and they, they've been, a lot of them are con conglomerates and they're super impressive businesses. So, so is the T for turnkey, is that really talking about delivering the all-in-one solution, right? The back office, the clearing, the custody, the allocation. It's, it, it's, it's more providing that one-stop shop for an advisor who wants to focus more on the interaction with their clients, maybe doing the tax planning, the state planning, things like that. And Asset management being one piece of that business, they try to get that one-stop shop. Is that that? That's kind of my understanding of it. But help, help, kind of uh, elucidate this. So the yes, and but they're they're mostly focused on broker dealers. So that whole channel, wirehouses, that whole channel, and that whole space. But there was a space that I was really interested in. That was the RIA channel is definitely growing. And it was financial advisors that were breaking away. So independent financial advisors that those, those companies and those tech stocks, they could work for them, but they might be too complicated for them. Super um, overwhelming. There was a lot of bells and whistles that a, a broker dealer might need that an RIA might not need, right? And so I think Colin kind of took this bet a really uh, over a decade ago that the RIA space 
was going to continue growing. And that's kind of proven out over the decade. And he um, went to solve this issue of an underserved market that was leaving. They were kind of these entrepreneurs. They wanted to leave the mothership. So I, I understood these humans, right? They were financial advisors. They liked investing. They wanted to be entrepreneurs, but then like, you can't do everything, right? So they have this kind of underserved, do I go? Do I take this whole tech stack? What do I use from it? How do I navigate this? This was, you know, born for, for, for a broker dealer. And so for, for six years, so the way that, that GeoWealth started, because I think it really explains, the history of GeoWealth really explains what differentiates GeoWealth and why it's not, it's not your grandmother's TAMP, right? It's a little bit different than your traditional asset manager term TAMP space. And it's but because- Jane, you have to remember, I also didn't come for money. My grandmother didn't have a TAMP. My grandmother used to buy these things called savings bonds, you know? <laughs> Like printed, printed actual bonds yeah. like that. And she'd give them to you as a birthday present. And you're like, thanks, grandma. I wanted like the, the pro wrestling NES video game, you know? And so instead I get the savings bond that I can't spend. Yeah. So. Actually, that's a pretty progressive grandmother. My, uh, my parents, my mother worked for wood as a lumberjack for a really long time. She ultimately became a teacher. Um, but, you know, like money was even a, a, a foreign concept to them. So actually, I consider that grandmother pretty, pretty. <laughs> well, I think sad. just back then with higher rates, grandma was like, you know, hey, I can buy the $25 bond, you know, savings bond for like 10 bucks because of the, you know, the PV of it, you know, with a 30 year bond. And so. <laughs> Ultimately, you know, I think grandma was being cheap and trying to only spend 10 bucks <laughs> until it's 25. But again, she also grew up in the depression era. So we'll give we'll give props to uh to Mama Mama Sherm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um I love that. So so the way that GeoWealth was born was kind of the opposite, right? It was born as a technology company and they acquired an RIA. So for six years, Colin, our president, and his partner and CIO, COO, Jack Hanna head down, doing every different job at the firm, building it out from scratch, really focused on software um, and proprietary technology enterprise software for this one RIA. So they, had, they acquired the RIA, they basically had one client for six years, which is incredible, right? And so the DNA of GeoWealth was really about the RIA and solving for the RIA, which I was fascinated by because I had always been of, you know, we, we build the cool thing and then we go out and sell it, right? This was, what do the what does the client want? Let's, let's go in and build that, which I loved. And I loved that being part of the DNA. And I loved, you know, fast forward uh, to today, they've got $21 billion in assets under advisement, seven and a half in assets under management. And they've really kept this DNA where, the RIA, so the independent advisor, let's say, goes in and they can do whatever they want on the platform, right? We've got the portfolio account and you can sleeve stuff. You can put in a double line model. You can build your own models. You can do whatever you want. And, and RIAs really want control and they want flexibility. So they've, they've built that. And I'm like, well, they've got the product market fit. They've got a growing space, right? I had been to business school. They were looking for a head of asset management because they really... Most of it, 70% of our assets are our IAs that they, they want to do their own investing. And we love that. We're perfectly fine with that. If nothing else, like I'm just going to try to help those clients um, make their decisions easier and, and do better and give them the analytics and the tools and whatever they need. And that's part of my job. But when I was looking around, I was like, what's better than having built something for a particular client in an underserved market that's growing? So for me, after meeting Colin, again, I had no idea what a TAMP was. He didn't care because I had the background of the due diligence, the content and commercialization, the investment management, the I had everything else. And I was super passionate about the RIA space. So um, that's kind of how I landed at GeoWealth. And that's the background of, of what GeoWealth is. So explain to me a robo-advisor and how that dif differs from a TAMP, um, you know, because the inkling is, well, first let's define robo-advisor and then distinguish what a TAMP is versus that. 
I love this question. Um, I worked all night so, on this. I stayed up really late <laughs> last night. So a robo advisor, and I built a robo advisor, is and a, a robo advisor. The the idea was to democratize investing, right? So it's offer a low cast portfolio, and it. Any mom pop, my mother could go in and she could buy a portfolio at any given time. You're not paying for an advisor, right? This is for the space in the market where you have an advisor. So when I was working on the robo, my job was all about that content, the communication, because I could have my mother, you know, who asked me what a Bitcoin was when it was at 61,000, right? It, investing in it, or I could have. So it's a great solution for someone that is not fortunate enough to be able to have a financial advisor, right? A TAMP, on the other hand, and what we're doing is for that part of the population that is fortunate enough to have a financial advisor, right, to be able to guide them through markets. And some of them will use very similar solutions. They'll use a model portfolio of ETFs. Maybe JP Morgan manages it. Maybe BlackRock manages it. Maybe I manages it. And we have a suite of models that they can go into, or they could pair them, or they could change them, but they've got the financial advisor, and the value of the financial advisor could be the investments, and a lot of them have their own investment philosophy that might be why they left their firm, right? Or they might not, they might just be people relationship managers and financial planners, right? And in that case, they understand and they'll go into a, a model. So we've got, you know, 40 model managers on our platform. Double Line is one of them. And they might manage portfolios of ETFs. They might manage portfolios of mutual funds. They might manage, you know, just the stocks, just the bonds. My job is to do the due diligence on all of those managers, find the best ones, do the, the detective work and the, the grilling that I've learned how to do, run the analytics and, and start to pair those managers together where they need help. But it's really about the financial advisor and the financial advisor. I mean, this whole business is so driven by emotion and money is driven by emotion and their job and what they're so good at is helping their clients not make irrational decisions, um, stick to their plan, change their plan when it needs to change, help with the, the planning, the tax, the all of the stuff that comes with being a human being and having financial needs. And so, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them do it themselves and they love it and they're good at it and they live and breathe markets. And a lot of them have realized, you know what, I want my time back and I'm going to let Jeffrey Sherman manage this or Sam manage this. And I'm going to let Jen do the due diligence and I'm going to outsource all of that because it's going to save a lot of time. So you're seeing kind of a move um, it's a slow move, but into to the model universe as well. Um, and then you're seeing in turn asset managers go into the model universe. And so it's been a, a kind of a cyclical, like more asset managers are in it, the better the, the product is in the model universe. And then the more that the clients want it. And the, so it's been, it's been interesting. I think it's in an infancy still. Um, and we're working on ways where we can, you can also build out kind of mosaics of models. They're called UMAs, Unified Managed Accounts. And so it's about kind of helping clients um, and our clients are enterprise RAs, build those, partner them together, tweak them where they want to um, without losing control. So it's, it's, it's about giving them the control that they want, that they don't want to lose since they left, you know, the, the firm that they were at, but still giving them what they want to outsource, whether it's the due diligence or just the ETF selection or the underlying ETF management or whatever it is. Yeah. So you, you talked about being a detective and in your investigative work. I feel like Sam and I watching you too, with that light shining on us from behind you, I feel like we're <laughs> in the interrogation room right now. So um, I've, I've been on the other side of your due diligence and I, and I know it is, is, is very rigorous, but Real quick to you keep mentioning this word models. And, you know, so explain to our listeners what you mean by models and you're talking about building them out and the likes. And then I'll let Sam ask a question because I know I cut him off. He gets excited about this stuff too. So. So a model, thank you for asking that question. A model is basically a an asset allocation. In some, it could be multi-asset or it could be one asset class. So it could be an entire 
portfolio for a client, like a robo, think about like a robo portfolio type of thing, or it could be just equity, or it could be just fixed income, or it could be a sleeve. But whatever it is, it's a, a, a group of ETFs or mutual funds, or some call it an SMA, some call it a model, but it could be a group of stocks. It could also be a group of individual bonds. So it's like the unwrapping an ETF or a mutual fund, right? Um, it's just another vehicle, just like when ETFs launched or mutual. It's funds trying to deliver. It's, it's trying to deliver. It's trying to deliver the turnkey solution, right? That's what it's trying to do. Is it's kind of one stop ish shopping, but it may not be one size fits all. Like a robo could be, for instance, it could be different for different clients as well. Is that is that fair? Yeah. So in the multi asset space, you tend to see a risk base suite of models, right? Which might feel a little bit more like a, a robo. So you'll have like a, a risk base, you have a conservative portfolio that's a one-stop shop, but you see the under you see the underlying ETF. So it's not like a target allocation mutual fund, right? When you're in your account, you'll see all the underlying ETFs. You might see underlying stocks if they have that in that portfolio. And then you could go all the way up to aggressive. And that tends to be more of a one-stop shop. A lot of our advisors will take that and they'll tweak it a little bit. So they'll go in and they'll they'll take, you know, cap, capital market assumptions tend to be free these days. You can go and you can go on blackrock.com or statetreat.com. You can see the capital market assumptions and they'll take that and they'll bring it over and they'll say, okay, I'll let them do that work, right? They've got hundreds of people around the globe doing it. And then I might fill it in with 70% State Street. And then I might put in a double line or I might, because they'll want to tweak it for clients. The, the, and so it'll be like their whole practice will use models, right? Which I think is a really smart way to scale your business, not by going, you know, Jeff gets this model and Sam gets this model. That's a, a recipe for disaster if you want to scale. But yeah. they might say my whole practice, every conservative client is going to get this, right? Now you've seen models and what we've done on our platform is we, we've grown our model marketplace. So it's not just those risk-based models, but we also have, you know, individual, uh, or we, we have satellite models, right? So we have fixed income. And so we'll look for the best fixed income managers, um, which is how I found you guys from, from my days at JP Morgan, or the best equity managers to deliver on a certain mandate. And then what they'll do is they'll create a model of models. So that client will go in and they'll see the single stocks, they'll see the, the fixed income ETFs, mutual funds, and then they'll see, you know, commodities, whatever they want within it. So there are different ways and shapes that the, inve the investments can take. And what's what's cool about GeoWealth and part of the reason I wanted to, to join is because the technology that they've built, because they've built each piece of code has been they've got the portfolio accounting that you can do it whichever way you want to. Um, so I think RA is really like that. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpackage there in what you just said, Jen, but uh, instead of jumping around, I'm going to try to keep it to model portfolios for a little bit until uh, we change course again. But with, with these models, what kind of trends have you been seeing in terms of uh, what uh, what advisors want, what asset managers are want to provide, what they think is the best idea, because those might not necessarily be the same thing at times. But just over time, is like what were some of the changes that you've seen since you know you started in, in this business? So, I started a year and a half ago um, in the in the RIA space and really focusing on models. So I'll tell you my experience. But over the last year and a half, we've gone through quite a lot, <laughs> quite a lot, right? I don't think what RAs and our audience wants has changed. They want uh, to, to have solid investment performance. They want to be able to trust their managers. They want to have the due diligence on top of it. Um, they want to have um, you know, the best providers. They kind of want a, a mix of big brands and boutique. And on the other side, asset managers are are trying to fill those gaps. And I, th I think they're going the right way for the most part, right? You've got advisors that they they no longer necessarily always want a one-stop shop. Like I think asset managers came out with models that were all risk-based. And then they realized RAs and, and clients actually want to take the best of, of each asset class and each manager and put it together. And so you've seen 
the rest of the space outside of your kind of robo feeling risk based portfolios you've seen the all the sub asset classes growing out so now you've got large cap growth managers models you've got large cap value models you've got a lot of alternative models coming out um you've got a lot of uh, you know buffer etf models and all all sorts of things that allow advisors to take a lot more views and to to, to implement portfolios with more tools, kind of like what you saw in the ETF space, right? It's all started with, you know, one-stop shop beta. And then you saw, uh, you know, diverse, you saw smart beta and you saw just different ways to do the index. And then you saw active, like you're kind of seeing that in the, in the model space as well in a different way. Yeah, so when you think about the model side too, and you're putting it all together, like, what is the benefit to the end client? Does the client move models? Um, is it the automation of the execution, kind of like what a target date fund does to you, where you're outsourcing how those managers and those model allocators or model providers, I guess I should say, are rejiggering their, their exposures to these portfolios? Like, how do you view that as being kind of, you know, um, useful to the end client, right? Yeah. So I think um, insource, I'm going to call them insourcers are RIAs that want to do it completely themselves versus outsourcers, which are the clients that are like, okay, I'm going to have a model provider do it. If you think about an advisor, right? An advisor that does insourcing is spending 20 to 30% of their time on investment management activities, right? it's a lot of time that they need to be growing their business, right? And particularly in years like 2022, they needed to be in front of their clients more than ever. And, and this year, and the liquidity and the, the banking crisis, like they really need to be doubling down and getting in front of clients. If you're outsourcing, you're spending less than 10% of your time. So I think there's a, a, a kind of a double-sided effect here where you've got, you're spending a lot of your time on investment research and due diligence, whatever aspect you're doing internally. But you're also, you're competing with firms with hundreds of people that are doing this with 100% of their time. Like, I can't imagine, can you imagine being, trying to do everything that everyone at your firm is doing, right? Plus everything that everyone at my firm is doing, plus everything. And so it's, it's kind of like how you're spending, you could cut your time in half and, and allocate and outsource to a model provider, but you could also, you're also upping your, your resources. So I think one thing that's stopped the industry or slowed the industry about moving to models is because RAs are really fee sensitive. They have to be, right? The bottom line, every dollar matters. But when they start to put that against the value that they get out of outsourcing, um, I think they, they start to, to weigh those decisions and weigh that and, and start to move into, um, into models more. And you've seen a lot of this data start to come out that, you know, outsourcers during COVID won more business and saved 10 hours on average a week uh, by outsourcing to investment management and, and frankly, usually had better investing returns. So I think you're seeing, you know, these trends move um, slowly, but they're moving and they make sense. And I think that the, the recent volatility has really expedited it because how can you follow the markets and follow stocks and follow what's going on and then also call your client and then remember why they had that one model and the other one had a different stock in it. Like you can't, you can't do everything. <laughs> um, no, and just add podcasting to it. And there you, you have just a full day, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you want to, you got to grow your business. Right. And, and you've really seen that in the RA space, but they're on their own. Right. And so having a provider, and then you think about all the risks that come along with that too. Um, regulatory risk, compliance risk, um, remembering why you did this, why you did that. It's And then the trading risk, right? That, that you're taking like one fat finger 
So outsourcing that, we have a lot of clients that just outsource the, the trading, the operations and that, that's a no brainer. Um, given that it's just an asymmetric risk return profile for, for going into, into something like trading. Um, yep. I mean, when you get it into asset sense, management, I mean. it's, yeah, sometimes I'm like, I can't, so why wouldn't you, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's for some RIAs that have already, it's like when you're really small, it might be too expensive for you, even for a low cost kind of TAM provider, right? And then you grow and you hired some of these people. So you have to make human capital decisions, um, which is not easy. You have to, so, so switching and, and adopting a TAM period is, can be a really, really tough decision. Uh, you have to be ready for it. You have to have the capacity to do it. Um, once you're there, once you're there, it's it's the way you're going to grow, right? Our our market is between uh, like two hundred and fifty uh, million dollar RIA and a six billion dollar RIA, and most of our our really big clients grew with us, right? They came in when they were small. They made the really hard decisions, um, but then they were able to to scale. Um, yeah. Um, I'm all for uh, the the outsourcing part, you know, as Jeff knows and jokes about, I've been trying to outsource uh, this podcast for a while too, but, you know, unsuccessfully <laughs> here, uh, successfully on the Monday morning minutes with the, with the help of Eric Dahl there. But uh, one question I guess I have is, you know, we, we have uh, maybe a hundred, what is it, 200 listeners now, Jeff? Probably doubled over the course of the last year. But uh, within our listener base, yeah, I assume we have some advisors out there and you know, let's say, you know, this conversation has piqued their interest. If they're starting mm -hmm. to think perhaps using uh, some type of TAMP provider, what are some of the things that they can do to get started and how they, they can think about evaluating and, you know, trying to differentiate amongst the, the various TAMPs out there to see what might be most suitable for them? Yeah, I'd say um, one of the things, if you're an RIA, um, one of the things that we do really well is, is help RIAs evaluate kind of what tech stack makes sense for them. Um, since we started as an RIA, we tend to also be a consultant to, to RIAs out there as they're thinking about moving. Um, if they are, you know, it, it, different channels can kind of go to different places, but there are really strong temps out there. Investnet is one of them. Orion is one of them. Asset Market named all of those before. But if you're an RIA that's really looking to grow and scale and you want that kind of hand-holding consultative approach and you want to know, where do I get started? What do I do? You know, just reach out to us, um, gwealth.com, and we'll, we'll help you through it. Yeah, so as you think through this too, and you want to evolve over time in your platform, and obviously you keep talking about growth for your clients, but growing your own business too, where do you see as being things that can be helpful where you can differentiate the GL Wealth platform from some of these other uh, turnkey solutions? I think from an asset management perspective, um, it's about providing customization and flexibility on the asset management side. I think a lot of our competitors have a model marketplace and they'll help you build really, really custom portfolios at a, at a high fee, right? What we're trying to do is, is merge the, the customization of asset management and the personalization that clients want there with the technology solutions that we have, right? So merge it, but do it in a scalable way. So we launched an investing consulting business. And the idea of it is to help advisors um, build their own models, but allow us to take them and run with them after. So we'll sit with the advisor we'll say, what is your DNA as a business? What do you want? Do you want low cost ETFs? Do you want really active management? Do you want traditional asset allocation? Do you want a little something different? And we'll help them whether it's going into one of our third-party providers or oftentimes it's just working with us using our asset allocation and filling that in with the types of managers and models they like. So maybe they want tax aware, maybe they want low cost, maybe they want ESG, maybe they want income, whatever that is. So what we're doing that I, I think is really differentiating is doing that, but then allowing them to scale that. So helping 
enterprises build practice models and then doing that at you know little to no additional cost because then we we use our technology and we scale it up for them so they've got this on their platform they can we give them a framework to and then we just run the models going forward so i think it's about finding finding that kind of intersection of two different things that feel so disparate right customization and personalization and scale kind of feel like opposites but it's finding how you can how you can customize and personalize the right things, right? Don't just like swap out a stock because someone mentioned, you know, one day, but really finding a, a solution for your practice, making it custom to your practice and your investment philosophy and your DNA, but then letting us build it out so it can be scalable. And one of the things we're doing that I think is, is really differentiated when we're doing that is we're building out white labeled content. So we are working with the manager. So I'd, I'd work with you guys if you were in one of our, our clients' portfolios and we'd build out these beautiful templates that the RIA could white label. I would have content coming in on a monthly, quarterly basis straight from the portfolio manager, 250 word maximum. You'd have a pie on the left that changed based on what was going on within the portfolio, commentary from the portfolio manager, and you'd get this beautiful book. It's all automated, right? It's like, you give me that, I put the data with it. I write one page on top that gives the kind of due diligence and manager, uh, portfolio manager view, and it's out the door and you get it first and you can, you can brand it. So I think it's about feeling custom and, and personal but not customizing for the sake of customizing. It's customizing in a really smart way. And so as we're building that out, um, we've built it out kind of with clients. I started, like I said, I started a year and a half ago. Colin knew exactly what RIAs wanted, but he let me do my own, own soul searching um, in the asset management space. He let me just sit down, work with clients. We took a very strategic view on it, which was, which was really nice. So I think what we've launched has been something that Again, along with the DNA of geo wealth, is just giving clients what they want. Um, yeah, when I first was listening to you about it too, and and listening to the, uh, I won't call it the pitch, but the idea about onboarding, it's like okay, here's the the high touch of the onboarding, but it also sounds to me that it's high touch, you know, on a full service business too, right? So. It's not just the onboarding. Here's what you want. Here's all the tools. Good luck, at Ms., Mr. or Ms. Advisor, and go out and implement this. Um, it's that you're guiding the advisor also through this process, and, and you know, uh, continuing to stay engaged with them, making sure that their their business hasn't changed as well. Is that is that a good interpretation? That's exactly right, and that's not just on the asset management side. That's geo wealth, right? I, I think one of the reasons that clients come over, but one of the reasons that they really fall in love with geo wealth is our service center. So it's, you know, you're talking to a human, we have this really sleek uh, back and forth messaging tool, but you've got a team that's dedicated to servicing. So if you're confused about how to put a trade in or what kind of, you know, what which one to pick, or you don't have the background in it, you know, we're there. Um, and so, so it is a full service and it's, it's definitely ongoing. We want to, we grow when our clients grow, right? So definitely all, all aligned, all aligned there. Um, so it's, it's been really interesting to see the last year and a half um, as we've grown and our clients have just, you know, they never leave, um, which is really, I think the sign of a, a really strong business and a, a product market fit. Yeah, Jen, well, I hate to say it, but uh, Sam ran some of our clients out the door last year. They didn't like owning bonds. And so uh, they ran for the hills. So I'm glad I'm glad that uh, your clients don't leave as well. But um, as I say, there's a home for you. If, if you're uh, if you're missing what we do here at Double Line, we're always here for you, uh, re regardless of uh, regardless of uh, what's going on out there. And we'll we'll try to help you through it. But um, I think this has been a great overview, Jen. Uh, maybe as a as a final, you could tell our listeners to and Sam, I hate to tell you, but there is more than 200 of them now. And therefore, we have to keep doing this. I know you're always looking for an out and down plane, but it is a multiple of that. Um, I didn't tell you what the multiple was. Uh, but <laughs> that being said, uh, maybe you could give us, um, you know, our listeners an insight on how they can learn more about geo wealth, 
how they can learn more about how, you know, how they can access your products and get in touch with you guys. Yeah, honestly, go to geowealth.com. You can submit a request in there. Um, email me, find me on LinkedIn. We, um, we just had an acquisition actually announced last week. We acquired First Ascent, a really fast growing TAMP out of Denver. So you probably could see us on the news if you Google us. Um, I did see it so, in the rags. Yeah. Uh, I get access to the rags still. And for those of you that want to get a hold of Jen, uh, she may not appreciate this, but however, if you're watching the video and you're watching this on the YouTube and you see it, a little <laughs> box under there it does have her email address in there. And so uh, you can access that. And Jen, if, if you don't want to see that, we'll block it out before we put it up there. So uh, just to see her away. No, you can, you can you can leave it on there. Yeah. I know that it's on there. I have four weeks until I deliver the, the baby in my belly. So as long as you get me in the next four weeks, um, I am more than happy to, to direct you in the in the right direction and and tell you a little bit about what we're doing, either on the okay. asset management side or, or geo wealth, just full full service. Well, I'm sure that, um, you know, in five weeks time too, you'll probably have some notice on your email that tells you who else to uh, contact or more importantly, someone will be monitoring your inbox. I know that's something we do uh, for our people on maternity and paternity <laughs> leave. So, um, and also Jan, uh, since you brought it up, I'd be remiss if I didn't say congratulations uh, on, on the birth of your child. And thank you for doing the pod podcast, as you told us. 36 weeks into pregnancy. So you're a trooper. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all of your time today. Thank you. Thank you for right, having But before we let you go, but before we let you go, we got to do something fun, Sam's right? favorite. Yep, Sam's favorite part of the show. So um, Sam, take it away. Yeah, Jen, I saw you about to push that leave button because uh, Sherman kind of left it open there. But no, we got to do my favorite part of the show, which is called Sherman Says. It's where I will offer a series of alternating prompts between you and Sherman, to which I want, a, I hope to get a, a top of mind response. So to pave the way, I'm gonna throw this out to Mr. Sherman with commodities. Challenging. All right, uh, back to you, Jen, with big banks. Ooh, poured <laughs> uh, in the storm. Ooh. M2. I, I could have used that for commodities, you know. Dang, too bad we didn't go the other way around. <laughs> I like I'll do commodities if you want. No, I no, I like to take whatever our uh, our guests are, their comments, and apply it to the next question. So that'd have been perfect on the other way around. So anyway, too late. Yeah, that's why you always get the first one too. So at least we get that one cold. But uh, back to you, Sherman, with M two. Port in the storm. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Scary, you know, we haven't seen monetary base contract, you know, and I don't even know. Tell me when it has, Lau. So uh, it's just, uh, this is really unprecedented with QT, with everything going on. I mean, you want to talk about putting the brakes on this stuff, uh, slow the money flow down and you can do it. So um, I guess the only hope left is velocity to kind of turn that over. So I got a little too wordy and nerdy. So I'll pass it back to you, Sam. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here with. Back to Jen with rent to own. Ooh, something that I should have done when I moved two two years ago. I rented to, to rent and then bought a, a year later. Um, a smart move for someone looking to 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 build equity, but I think own right now. Yeah, but it's funny because uh, maybe five years ago or six years ago we were in the trading desk and uh, and uh, Sam sees this commercial for the rent to own on TV. Like, hey, you can rent to own, you can get this PlayStation 4. And so Sam's like, ooh, I want a PlayStation 4. And so we looked it up and it turned out like, what is it, like a $400 like device or something? If you made the payments on it, it would end up costing you $2,200. <laughs> and so uh, I just say, uh, sometimes the rent to own may not be as good as the rent to rent and then own to own later, Jen. So fine print, caveat emptor. All right. Maybe you can use uh, Jen's answer for this one, Sherman, sure, because I did mess it up. You know, my reading skills aren't that that great. So I meant to say rent versus own. Give this that for me. Oh. That's for you. No, that's for you, Sherman. Oh. So you can play oh, off for me. That first one. 
Uh, rent the risk asset rally, own protection at this point. All right. Back to you, Jen, with FDIC. Oh, um, port of the storm. <laughs> that is, yeah. All right, you're going to like this one then, Sherman. Uh, contagion. Gosh, there's a lot of storms and stuff in here. Yeah. Uh, there's never one cockroach. Or as you've been singing, La Cucaracha. You know. See, see. Back to you, Jim, with uh, Return to Office. Ooh. If the culture's there. All right. If the culture's there. If the culture's there, return to office. And I work from home and I miss, I miss office life. But if the culture's not there, let the people do what they want. Look at the culture in the background there, Jen. The culture is here, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah, collaboration is is tough absent culture. So, yeah. yeah. Right there. Uh, back to you, Sherman. Bring us into the final round here. Petrol dollar. Ooh. Is it still going to be a petrol dollar? Is it petrol remimbi? Is it petrol ruble? I don't know. Uh, seems to me that the world is they're they're always threatening to go from the petrodollar system and sure feels a lot realer this time. So, um, you know, a realer being that the the change from the dollar based system onto an alternative currency. And I don't think it's going to be petro crypto. Um, I think it actually comes back down to some of these other currencies. So uh, time will tell. All right. To bring us home here, Jen, with gold. Ooh, a commodity unlike any other commodity. Yep, it's one of those more financial related ones, right? So, well, Jen, this has been great. Again, we really appreciate the time spent today. I know uh, you're you're struggling here too to stay stay with us through all of this. We really appreciate you spending the time. Again, Jen Wing at Geo Wealth. I won't give you her email address, but if you watch this on the YouTube, uh, you can find it there. So it's youtube.com backslash double line capital. You can see all of our videos on there, previous episodes, our clips from various media sources, our webcast, our podcast, and anything else we, we deem compliant friendly to put up from the annals of double line. So thanks again, Jim. We really appreciate the time today. I can't say it enough. And congratulations once again. Thank you both for having me. Okay, take care now.